So, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, I have the uh, great privilege and honor to welcome Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs and European Affairs of the Slovak Republic, Miroslav Lajčák. Dear Miro, welcome to Bucharest. Thank you. Um, and uh, we are honored that you have accepted this uh, uh, presence at, at the panel dedicated to the uh, current challenges we are facing within the EU. What a better time for discussing <laughs> these issues. And uh, there are quite a few, I would say. Uh, we are probably facing now the most challenging period for the uh, European Union since its creation, with such a broad, broad range of complex situations to be tackled, both internally and externally. We have uh, the persisting instability in, uh, in our neighborhood. We have global security threats. We have uh, economic issues. Of course, the magnitude of the uh, recent migration wave uh, but also the uh, terrorist phenomenon which is growing. Um, all these are unprecedented challenges that we have to face with. And uh, this is a crucial junction when we are called to, to determine what is the answer of the uh, European uh, Union. In our view, we need more than ever uh, solidarity, we need unity, we need common action. We need to uh, do this in order to defend our, our, our common values. We need to cooperate closely. We need to identify the solutions. And uh, the experience so far showed that we cannot act in isolation, neither inside the EU nor on the global arena, if we want, of course, to achieve long-lasting results. National unilateral solutions simply don't work. So we need to act more effectively together in meeting challenges like the fight against terrorism or the uh, management of migration. The debate on, my, debate on migration will continue to be high on the agenda, that's for sure, and for quite some time. So we need a fundamental reframing of this debate, resulting in a balanced and sustainable migration strategy that will help to address the root causes of this uh, phenomenon. If we uh, also speak about fighting terrorism, we need a coordinated and structured approach, also at EU level, ensuring a proper balance between security and fundamental rights and freedoms, including the free movement of persons, which is a fundamental pillar of, of the European Union. We need also to enhance the European Union's role at, at the global stage, to foster stability, to foster development, to engage more with uh, our international uh, partners. Inside the EU, we need to build or to rebuild the trust of the citizens of the European Union in the European project. And we have to deliver concrete results for the citizens. Economic growth, new jobs, more competitiveness, the completion of the single market, the developments regarding the economic and monetary union, they might play a key role in this process. We are also starting to prepare for our presidency of the Council in 2019. We have discussed this when I visited Bratislava uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, for us, this is the first uh, such kind of, uh, of exercise, and we are looking forward to uh, exchange experience, in fact, for you to share with us your experience in the preparation of uh, the uh, presidency of the Euro European Council in the uh, second semester of next year. This is a huge challenge, but also, I think, uh, uh, an excellent opportunity, which uh, allows for uh, an enhanced uh, multiple responsibilities to assume more responsibilities in the European decision-making. Uh, there are many dimensions to take into account in the preparation stage. We have started our reflection uh, process, but we are looking again, we are looking forward to learn from your uh, experience and how, how did you cope with the challenges in preparing the, the uh, EU presidency. As I have mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of my intervention, I want to uh, thank again to uh, His Excellency Miroslav Lajčák, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign and European Affairs of Slovakia, a very good friend of Romania. I think this is the best definition of our uh, friendship. He has a long and complex experience as a diplomat, both in the Slovak diplomacy and in the European External Action Service, as Managing Director for Europe and Central Asia, coordinating as EU Chief Negotiator also the uh, negotiations on the uh, association agreements with the Republic of Moldova and Ukraine, 
EU representative in the 5 plus 2 uh, format for the uh, Transnistrian settlement, EU special representative for Bosnia and Herzegovina, this, and there are many other uh, important tasks that uh, our guest today achieved. He is one of the most knowledgeable people I know to talk on such kind of issues we are debating on this panel. And again, most of all, he's a great friend of Romania. So, without further ado, let me invite our guest, dear Miro, you have the floor. Thank you. I'll be speaking. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and for your invitation. The colleagues, I was looking forward to this meeting and I'm pleased to have the chance to see the creme de la creme of the Romanian Foreign Service. This is not flattery. I mean what I say. First of all, having been ambassador myself twice in my career, I have a great appreciation and admiration and respect for the job of an ambassador. We all know how important it is. It's not the job that you can measure or quantify on a daily basis how much you have done, but obviously you can do tremendously lot to improve or not to improve relations between your country and the country you are posted to. And I also want to say right at the beginning that I have always had a great respect for Romanian diplomacy that has been always traditionally very professional and very committed to promote and defend interests of your country. And that's exactly how this job should be done. Bogdan asked me to focus particularly on the preparation of our EU presidency that comes in the second half of the next year, that means less than 10 months from now. But before that, I would like to make two other points. First one on our bilateral relations, which are exceptional, very strong, built on a very solid basis. As they like to say, we are sharing common values, common challenges, but this is not a cliche. And there have been important moments in our history when both Romania and my country, whatever its name was at that time, were standing on the same side of the barricade. I want to mention the period between the two wars, when Europe was challenged by the threat of revisionism, and it was the wisdom, the strategic vision, and the leadership of your legendary Nicolae Titulescu, who was promoting protection of stable borders, maintenance of peace, good relations between large and small states, respect of, for sovereignty and equality of all nations, collective security, and also prevention of aggressions. And it's a, a sad irony that all these principles are becoming more relevant today than we have ever expected them to be. I should also mention, and I, I'm glad to be able to mention here, the instrumental role that your army has played in liberation of my country from fascism and Nazism in the Second World War. And this is what we remember very well in Slovakia, what we cherish, celebrate. Last Saturday we had, we had the celebrations or the commemoration of the 71st anniversary of the Slovak national uprising with the presence of your president of your parliament, who also visited what is the largest military cemetery of Romanians abroad, which is located in central Slovakia near the city of Zvolen. And my third element that clearly fortifies what I said about the quality of our bilateral relations is your role, or better to say, no role of your country in the occupation of then Czechoslovakia by the five countries of Warsaw Pact, 21st of August 1968. Not only Romania refused to participate, but also in strongest terms, condemned the action. And given the circumstance, circumstances at that time, it was a very brave thing to do, which we remember and will not, will not forget. But there are many other things we have in common. One of them is, be, is the respect for international law, which is not so much in fashion these days. But we believe, both here in Romania and in Slovakia, that we have to have one set of rules and principles that should be applied to everyone, every country should respect it, be it big or small. Otherwise, we risk ending up with several subsystems with different rules that will be defined by the country that is strongest in that given region. And this is not where we, are, where, where we want up to end up. Unfortunately, it looks like we are going there. Nowadays, both Romania and Slovakia are firmly anchored in the European Union and NATO, which 
helps us to enhance our bilateral relationship to a uh, new and higher and more complex level. You know that Slovakia was the first EU member state to ratify the Romania's accession treaty to the European Union, and you also know that we are consistently and loudly supporting what has been long overdue, namely your inclusion into the Schengen system of the European Union. If there is a Schengen system, that's in another story, we can discuss that. We have very close position on a number of foreign policy issues, be it our support for the Western Balkans integration into the European Union, be it our support for uh, Republic of Moldova's democratic and European transformation, be it our position on Kosovo, be it our position on the protection of national minorities, but also a number of issues uh, on a geopolitical scale. And there is one more special phenomena that brings our two countries even closer together, and this is the Slovak minority living here in, here in Romania for more than two centuries, living together with the majority population in peace and harmony. For more than two centuries, the Slovaks in Romania were able to maintain their national identity, their language, their culture, their traditions, their beliefs. And of, of, obviously, we know that this would not be possible without a positive approach from the Romanian people. Two years ago, we held a seminar by, organized bilaterally by Romania Slovakia with the presence of Council of Europe. And at that time, the Deputy Secretary General of the Council of Europe said that NADLAC, this is where the seminar was held, could serve as a cultural model for other ethnically mixed settlements in Europe. And I think we, sh we could and should do more to promote the model of coexistence of majority and minority here in Romania, uh, rather than to I mean, witnessing promotion of other models of minority policy. The fact is that the Romanian Slovaks, as we call them, are fully integrated. They are bilingual. Uh, there is definitely no hidden political or any other agenda, neither on the side of Slovakia nor within uh, their, the, the community itself. So all these are facts, and these facts show that our two countries have so much in common and that we are natural allies in this difficult and challenging world, and I think we can do more to use this to promote our views and our interest whenever and wherever we share them, and there are many cases. My second point is on the current situation in the European Union. Not easy, obviously. This could be a topic for another lecture, which uh, I was not asked to deliver, so I won't. I just want to make three short points. Number one, migration. Definitely challenge, the biggest challenge, unprecedented challenge. Definitely uh, Europe was unprepared. Europe is still not in a position to react adequately to this. Uh, there is no clear strategy. There is no clear leadership. So it looks like after a long vacation, during the month of August, European institutions are waking up and, and uh, showing some signs of activities, which is good. What is equally important, or even more important, is that we approach this complex issue in a comprehensive manner. So there are many aspects to this, to this problem. I'll try to mention some of them. And our national position is that we really need to have an honest, open discussion about all the factors that are determining uh, the, the phenomena of migration. First, saving lives and offering shelters to those who need our humanitarian assistance. It goes without saying humanity is at the very core of the European idea. But at the same time, we need to tackle the root causes, to look into the countries of origin, to look into what we are doing there, what we are doing wrong, what we are not doing enough. Furthermore, we need to fulfill our responsibility when it comes to the protection of external EU borders, and in particular, the, the Schengen borders. Right now, as I said already, there is no Schengen. You know how difficult it is to get the Schengen visa for a, for a serious businessman? Now we have tens of thousands of people marching into Schengen without being stopped, without being controlled, without being registered. And we are pretending that there is no problem with this. It is a problem. It is a huge problem. We need to break the smuggler's business model. There are people who are making huge money 
on, on other people's sufferings and lives. And uh, I don't see enough effort undertaken by our intelligence services, by our police, to act in a coordinated manner to destroy the, this network of people. As long as this is a good business, it will continue. We need to restrain access to our social benefits, because apart from people who really run to rescue their lives, we all know that there, are, there is a huge number of people who are coming for better living conditions. What's the purpose, once you are in Calais, to try to run into Dover? There, is there a civil war in France, or is it not a safe country? So try to convince me that these people who are trying to, to, to run from Calais to Dover are running for their life. No, that's not true. So we really need to deal with the issue as it is. And we need to divide those who need our assistance and rescue from those who are only economic migrants. We need to offer solidarity to, uh, to our Euro EU partners, those who are unable to cope with the responsibility. So we shall, to, we shall help them. We are not doing that, that enough. We, we have to be better coordinated, more effective in, in protecting our external borders. Obviously, we need to take into account the specific situation, uh, including the historic and social sensitivities in different countries. Because right now, the approach coming from Brussels has been, and I'm very pro-Brussels person, and that's why I'm so openly crit critical to it. It's very bureaucratic, technical. Quotas, accept quotas, and the problem is solved. No, the problem is not solved with quotas. It will not stop the business. It will not stop the, the influx. Let's not pretend that the that discussion about migration equals the discussion about quotas. Quotas are part of the discussion, but it's certainly the part that is dealing with the consequences, not with the root causes, and not with the loss of lives, and not with the dirty business. Obviously, it would be naive if we wanted to ignore that all this brings with it also potential hidden terrorist threat. And it's also something that we have to look into. We, we, life is teaching us not to be naive, and we should not be naive. And finally, we should safeguard our freedoms. So whatever measures we undertake, they, they must not steal the freedoms we were fighting so hard to be part of, uh, and to limit, I would say, the comfort of our own citizens. So any solutions that would suggest that we close our borders, that we eliminate Schengen, so on and so forth, would be the, the, the solutions that would be hitting hard our own citizens. And therefore, it won't, will not be a good, good solution. My second point on the European Union is that it's really important, it's crucial for EU to act as a global player, to be in a preventive, proactive mood, and to be able to, to play its role on the global scale particularly when it comes to our closest neighborhood, be it in the south, be it in the east. But we cannot aspire to be a, a superpower, which is what we uh, are willing to be, if we are unable to sort out things in our closest neighborhood. And that's, that's very important. Ukraine, an issue I'm sure you've discussed already, and we'll, we will be discussing one sentence. Two biggest challenges to, uh, Ukraine is facing are peace and reforms. When it comes to peace, we have Normandy format and we have the Minsk group. We shall respect, we shall support, and we shall insist that uh, the commitments are implemented by both sides. When it comes to reforms, I think European Union could do much more. We have the know-how, we have the expertise, and uh, this is where I would like to see greater visibility of the European Union, assisting Ukrainian people to change the model of functioning of Ukrainian society and to help them transform into a European direction. Because this is what the Ukrainian citizens want. They clearly demonstrated it uh, in Maidan and, and afterwards. Somehow, I have the feeling that many of us are making very tough statements in favor of Ukraine. But when it comes to concrete support, then we are shy. So I would definitely rather. Uh, see this vice versa. And Russia, whatever we think about Russia, Russia is here, it's nowhere to go. And we have no policy on Russia right now. Because business, no business as usual is no policy for me. So I understand that in the aftermath of, of the annexation of Crimea and of the criminal behavior of Russia in the Eastern Ukraine, 
we said we cannot no longer have the business as usual, but it's been more than a year now, so it's probably time to, to, to start discussing, okay, so then what business are we going to have with Russia? No business as usual, that means the different business. Let's discuss what different business. We cannot ignore Russia, it's too big, it's too important. You cannot isolate a country that is permanent member of the UN Security Council. So I really believe that both within EU, EU and NATO will have to start a discussion about how we see our future relations with Russia in the months and years to come. There is clearly no return to what it was before but we shall not continue being in limbo. Another challenge which is particularly relevant to our presidency is uh, the UK's referendum. Some call it Brexit. I don't like this word because it somehow presumes the outcome, the outcome we don't want to see. Obviously, we want the UK to stay in the European Union, and, and this process might very much coincide with our presidency in the European Union. When it comes to our position, on the issue of the UK uh, uh, referendum. First of all, we want to see not UK leaving the European Union, but UK staying in a better, reformed, more efficient, less bureaucratic European Union. So when Prime Minister Cameron presented his views of the process to us, we said we support many of them. We really believe that a number of points is very relevant. There are two buts when it comes to Slovak national position. First of all, no limit to free movement of persons. We will never accept that. And second, we are very skeptical when it comes to opening up treaties. So let's explore the, uh, the space that we have within the existing uh, EU treaties, but the opening up the treaties would also mean opening up Pandora's box and no one knows where this may get us. So uh, our message to the British people is exactly similar to the message Prime Minister Cameron had to the Scottish people just on the eve of the Scottish referendum, namely, we want you to stay, we are better off together. And now finally, let me turn to the topic of the preparations for our EU presidency. And I will share with you the details of, of the process. You are coming three years later, which is a good time to start thinking about the process. Because uh, it's a big thing, particularly when it's the first presidency, which is the case both for Romania and for Slovakia. It's a unique opportunity for country to promote itself, but also challenging responsibility. In our system, it's my ministry, Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs, which is responsible for organizing uh, and preparing the presidency. And we started exactly four years prior to the presidency, 1st of July 2012. Normally the countries that for, for whom this is a routine, they start two years before. But I, my, suggest, my first recommendation to you is take time. You never know, and it's, it's better safe than sorry. And therefore I, I suggest that four years in advance is good. Why? Because uh, this gives you time for effective planning, for management, and of course, of people. So what were our first steps? First, we established several coordinating bodies and working groups for particular agendas. First, logistics and organizations. Second, personnel and administration. Third, financial and budgetary issues. And fourth, communication. And we involved experts from all line ministries uh, and made them part of these groups. Secondly, it's very important to have early and regular cooperation between the foreign ministry and the, the line ministries because uh, I can tell you what was the situation in Slovakia and I would not be surprised to see that uh, it will be sort of similar here. The number of line ministries have the feeling that presidency is something for the foreign ministry to deal with and they don't have any business with that. So it's really important to make them aware, both on the pol political and experts level, that everybody is responsible for the presidency. And ironically, after Lisbon, it's probably the two most knowledgeable people about EU affairs in every government, which is the prime minister and the foreign ministers, are the only one who are not chairing the councils. Everybody else is chairing the council, so ministers must get ready for that. And I would even dare to say they, they have to get 
adequately scared of the presidency so that they, they, they take the preparations seriously. We have uh, up to date presented 17 documents to our government, documents that were drafted by my ministry and then approved by the government so that we have got now governmental resolutions tasking concrete ministries to do concrete things. And these documents are, again, covering all fields that I mentioned. Logistics, organization, financial planning, personnel, presentation, and communication strategy, and also regular progress reports. That means that I submit official progress reports to the government on a regular basis so that there is an official assessment of the state of the preparation and of the challenges of the, of the shortcomings, if, if there are any. People, extremely important. And it's not only selecting the right people to do the job, but also to have them, give them time and the possibility to, to develop good interpersonal relations with their counterparts in trio countries, because trio communication is extremely important, and also EU institutions. And to give them necessary training, because let's face it, we do not have people who are now immediately absolutely ready to take up the job of presiding over working groups. They need to be trained, and training takes time. So for this purpose, we have developed a complex educational program that consists of first, language education, second, soft skills training, third, institutional preparations, which was provided by the European Parliament and the General Secretariat of the Council, and fourth, general EU affairs training. Uh, in our case, over 1,200 civil servants are currently enrolled in this training program, preparation for the presidency. Line, minister, line ministries hired part-time personnel to cover additional workload. Almost 350 people were hired by the other ministries to help them uh, as a presidency support staff. In, in uh, my ministry, first we have established a presidency unit, which then turned into a presidency directorate. And since 1st of January this year, is a Directorate General for the Presidency. So we have a Directorate General for the EU Affairs, uh, which continues to deal with, uh, with the substance, with the EU agenda. And we have the Presidency Directorate General, which deals with the organizational and logistical issues. And we have 60 people working in that Directorate General preparing uh, our Presidency. Uh, we are doubling or more than doubling number of our uh, personnel at our permanent representation in Brussels. So our, our standard numbers are just below 100 diplomats plus uh, administrative staff. We will end up with 217. For that purpose, we had to find and lease a new building because our existing building was just not big enough. And doing all this again, requires a lot of time, so we really have to do the planning well in advance. What else to pay special attention to in early stages? The most sensitive issue is uh, organizing and carrying out the public procurement. Because it's relatively easy or manageable to do things that are fully under our control. But there comes a moment when you have to go out and organize things like public procurement, which you are no longer in control of. And uh, this process obviously is time consuming, and therefore it's really good to start organizing public procurements at least two years in advance, because this could be tricky. Procured services include security, transport, catering, accommoda accommodation, accreditation system just to mention a few. What's also important is to, at early stages, to start planning uh, for the informal ministerial meetings. And now I'm not referring to the agenda, but rather to the venue. And because you really have to find appropriate place and you have to equip the place, make sure that uh, it meets all the necessary technical requirements and security requirements and then also to provide uh, transport on, and all of this. Uh, 
will be hosting some 18 informal ministerial meetings, so I think this is more or less routine. You will have to decide whether or not you want to, uh, apart from all this, whether you want to have something big, like Eastern Partnership Summit or any other summit. Uh, uh, we, we do not plan to have any. Uh, there is no demand for that. I was volunteering for Eastern Partnership Summit, but Natalia German was faster and she offered Moldova, which I gladly accepted. Uh, but the truth is that 2016 would be too early after Riga as well. What's also important is the general political consensus that uh, understanding of the presidency as a national ownership, ownership of all political parties and of the whole society. It must, should not be, and must not be seen as an elite project, something that has nothing to do with the rest of the country and the rest of the people. In our case, it is even more specific because our presidency starts 1st of July next year, but we will have parliamentary elections end of February or beginning of March. So technically speaking, we are preparing the presidency for the incoming government, which we hope to be still us, but uh, you never know with the diplomacy. So we want to make sure that everybody feels part of the process so that we are not blamed by those who might come after that they know nothing, they disagree, they would have done things differently and so on and so forth. For this purpose, we have signed a memorandum with all parliamentary political parties already in March 2013. And all political parties agreed to two, two principles. First, that the presidency is, a pri is an issue of national interest and the success of the presidency is in the interest of every political party. And second, that the pre pre preparation of the presidency will not be misused for daily political bickering and will not become a part of the parliamentary campaign. Uh, and so far we have managed to uh, have this respected. Also thanks to the fact that every document, I said we have already have 17 documents approved by the government, each of them was beforehand sent to the political parties for their consideration, for their comments, uh, and only after that uh, went to the, to, the, to, the, to the government. And uh, I am holding regular briefings with the leader of parliamentary political parties, again, to inform them about, about the pro progress of the process. Uh, so that they feel involved, they feel uh, the responsibility or at least the ownership of the process. And obviously we are absolutely open to any political party, any politician at any time to answer any question. I think that's very important. It is important to develop good coordination and communication with the government and with the national parliament. Parliament has a great role to play in the presidency. There are uh, prescribed activities that are uh, undertaken by national parliament. So it's good to make sure that parliament is aware, is, it, is early enough in the process of preparations and of course the coordination between the government and the parliament uh, is instrumental here. Budget. So if we are aiming for a budget at the level of approximately 70 million euro, which will be the lowest presidency budget among the Visegrad four countries. For your information, the most expensive or the largest part of the budget comes to the personnel related expenses. That means sending all the people to Brussels and and uh, all the apartments and, and salaries and everything. In our case, it's like 27 million out of 70. And the, the public procurements. Another important element is the sponsorship. Again, if we want to decrease the budget, to lower the budget, we have to engage the private se sector in a, in the case of Slovakia, we did not have a law regulating uh, sponsorship. So we had to change the law so that we can ask the sponsors. And we hope that we will be able to acquire sponsorship, for example, on transport, on beverages, on telecommunication services, or IT equipment. It's a big difference whether you have to, to, to buy 40 new limo limousines or have them you know, provided by one of the uh, importers. 
so uh, this is probably on the log logistics side. And here I want to use this opportunity to assure you that we are absolutely open and ready to share all our knowledge with you at any stage before, after, here in Bucharest or in Bratislava. So uh, don't hesitate and don't be shy to ask. Another important point is the communication. How to communicate the presidency to our people, it's not so easy. People, uh, the journalists keep asking us, so tell me in one simple sentence why the presidency is good for my country, for Slovakia. And we, being very sophisticated diplomats, we struggle to produce one simple sentence that would be understandable to my grandmother, why it's good that Slovakia will hold the presidency. So this must not be underestimated. Uh, and for this, it's important really to develop a good communication strategy. Normally, we are going to be the spokespersons of the European Union, of the family of 28. But for our countries, and I believe it's also the same for Romania, we also have to use this for better communication of European agenda with our own public. And you know that in Slovakia we have had for three consecutive times the lowest turnout in elections for European Parliament, so we have also uh, have the ambition to use the presidency to change this uh, for, and to improve our performance. And to, to enhance the general interests in the EU affairs among, among the public in Slovakia. So, and how to do that? As I said, we are trying to build collective ownership. For example, the logo. We have uh, approached not only professionals, but general public, inviting everybody to present their suggestions, proposals for our presidency logo. And I'm very satisfied with the outcome. Both with, we, we had more than 200 uh, entries, proposals of a very good quality. And uh, the one that won, which is still a secret, was, was uh, designed by a student. So which is a good promotion for, for the idea. And we are also preparing an ambitious outreach uh, uh, into the NGO society, schools, and regions. Our presidency will be centered in Bratislava, as is the habit lately. But we are now working on how to involve the regions, how to give the regions possibility and opportunity to present themselves, how to present our culture, food, music of different regions, so that they also feel that they are part, part of, the, of the endeavor of the presidency. And in Slovakia, we have a very efficient platform, which is called National Convention. Madame Sarge knows it very well, which uh, was initially created to discuss the issues related to to our accession to the European Union, but we have sort of revived the National Convention, and this is a permanent platform to discuss EU agenda in Slovakia. We are inviting scholars, politicians from abroad, uh, from Slovakia, and this gives people opportunity to listen and to speak up uh, uh, on, uh, on the EU matters. Now on the substance, on TRIO cooperation and the presidency program, we, have, we are part of the trio with Netherlands that comes before and Malta that comes after us. We have initiated the first meeting of the trio partners uh, in March last year. So it was still more than two years before the presidency itself. The aim at that time was mostly to establish good working personal relations uh, within the trio group with our trio partners. And when it comes to defining the priorities, I'd like to draw your attention to three particular areas that should be handled carefully. First is the early and regular cooperation between the foreign ministry and the national line ministries, as I said, and their cooperation with their trio counterparts. Normally, the other ministers are rather shy when it comes to international cooperation and the communication with the partners. It's really important that the push comes gently from the foreign ministry so that they establish uh, contacts with the partners in trio countries. The second, equally important, is the regular com co communication and contacts with the, with the relevant EU institutions, the Council Secretariat, European Commission, European Parliament. And thirdly, as I mentioned at the beginning, 
it's equally important to work with the expert level as well as with the political level when it comes to the line ministries in our national governments. Speaking about the priorities, now there are two sets of priorities, the trio presidency priorities and our national priorities. When it comes to the trio presidency program, the draft is being finalized now and the final version will be adopted at the December General Affairs Council. We have agreed to go for a short strategic and political document, so our trio program will be much shorter than all those that you have uh, seen before. And obviously is copying to a great extent the strategic agenda for the European Union, the five key areas, job creation, growth and competitiveness, empowering and protecting citizens, energy and climate policies, freedom, security and justice, and finally the EU as a strong global actor. When it comes to our national priorities, uh, obviously we still have time uh, to detail them. They will be more el elaborated and, 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 and greater details. So what I can share with you exclusively, because it's still not official, are the areas that we see as uh, the areas where Slovakia has uh, its added value and has something to say and that we want to see among our presidency priorities, which are first, digital single market, second, European Energy Union, third, this is not our choice, but it, it, this comes uh, during our presidency, namely the review of the multi-annual financial framework, 2014-2020, furthermore, fight against the unemployment, creation of the Eurozone fiscal instruments, Eastern Partnership, Western Balkans, enlargement. We are the only trio country that mentions enlargement in, in its priorities. So uh, this is where we stand with the preparation. Uh, and uh, as I said, this will be formally adopted in the course of the next year. So this is where we stand when it, with, with the preparation of our presidency. Once again, it's a, it's a great challenge. And I'm looking forward to when this is over and we will be coming to lecture you uh, uh, on how to, how to do a good presidency. I hope our presidency will be a successful one. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. I want to encourage you to work closely with your Slovak counterparts in the countries where you are posted. And I would like to encourage all of us to join forces whenever we can make the voice of what is known as New Europe better heard to protect our interest. I thank you very much.